excuse me, I needed to record that. Welcome all to the Brain Health and Wellness Initiative Series. Tonight, our presenter is Dr. Dennis Grossman, and he is presenting on hormones and dementia, how insulin, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, melatonin, adrenaline, and leptin affect cognition. My name is Hannah Doles, and along with my colleague, Nicole Herbert-Hale, we provide care navigation in the JFSA care, Dementia Care Navigation Program. Our program establishes an empowering environment to help improve the quality of life of those who have dementia or are at risk of developing dementia, all while helping family caregivers reduce the stress and burden that often occurs while caregiving. At JFSA, we understand the importance in working with our clients' strengths and applying a person-centered care approach to care, which extends through our multidisciplinary team of geriatricians, nurses, social workers, and geriatric psychiatrists. Nicole and I meet our clients where they are at to develop individualized care plans that help produce solutions to presenting problems. From linking persons with dementia and their families with community resources to following them with their medical management. We are their point of contact for guidance as well as a listening ear. We consider the intersectionality of one's life when creating interventions that adhere to their biopsychosocial needs and experiences. Before we begin, I do wanna go over how to ask a question during the webinar. You'll notice a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please use that feature when, um, when you have any questions during the presentation, I will um, get to them at the end of our, our discussion. Um, we also do want to remind you about our CE credits. It will take um, 30 days from the date of your application, which is the completion of the survey, to issue your CE credit. The CE credit, um, you will actually get a survey after this presentation. It may not come tonight. It may come in the next few days, but there will be a link um, with uh, to the survey as well as the slides if you'd like to review them. Uh, once we review um, your survey, the CE certificate will be emailed to you at the email address you provided during the registration. The email address that you use to access the webinar must be the same one as you are providing. If you enter a different or incomplete email address, it will prevent your CE from being issued. So if you're unsure of the email you used to attend, just check your original confirmation email. You're also welcome to contact Nicole and I to double check that. And without further ado, oh, talking about Dr. Grossman, of course, <laughs> I have to give a little background. Um, he is a graduate of Case Western Reserve School of Medicine with over, over 30 years of experience in internal medicine. Dr. Grossman has been on the staff of University Hospitals Bedford and Ahuja Medical Centers, Cleveland Clinic South Point and Marymount Hospitals, Metro Health Medical Center, and also um, a clinical instructor with the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, as well as our former medical director here at JFSA. He served as chairman of medicine and chief of staff at UH Bedford Medical Center as well. He has had several affiliations with several nursing homes where he followed his patients after their discharge from hospital stays. Dr. Grossman offers continuity of care and values the personal relationships with patients by following them over time with continuous monitoring to ensure positive health outcomes. For the past 30 years, Dr. Grossman has been interested in the effects of diet on chronic Western diseases and promoted plant-based diets and macrobiotic diets. Dr. Grossman believes that they play a key component in preventing and reversing some types of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, and degenerative joint disease. And now, without further ado, Dr. Grossman will go into our discussion tonight. Thank you for coming to JFSA this evening. Thank you, Hannah. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think that uh, the topic is kind of a complicated topic because hormones are very complex, um, but really um, they are key in sort of understanding how we operate in our environment and in our internal environment. 
And what I like to think of is that hormones are really the end results of how we interface with our external environment and how we maintain our internal homeostasis. And if you think of it, um, the body has the ability to uh, retrieve sensory information. The brain and the autonomic nervous system are able to uh, recruit certain parts of the body to deal with each specific stimuli. And it uses um, nerve endings, but it also uses a set of very complicated um, enzymes, which are uh, hormones. And these circulate throughout the body, affecting all the cells in many different ways. So if there was an abundance or a lack of food, this would activate one set of enzymes, uh, hormones versus another. If you encountered a stressful stimuli, uh, different enzymes or hormones would be uh, stimulated. So these hormones orchestrate nuances of our human existence from safety, from growth, socialization, metabolism, and procreation. It's our body's chemical messengers. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, sending signals into the bloodstream and the tissues far and wide, regulating metabolism through such hormones as the thyroid and growth hormone, through insulin and leptin, um, maintaining our homeostasis, our our environment, our milieu through the thyroid hormones and insulin, responding to stress through cortisol and adrenaline, initiating growth maturity through the growth hormone, ensuring procreation via testosterone, estrogen, and ensuring a, a balanced sleep-wake cycle through melatonin and serotonin. So I want to shift to cognitive decline, and uh, we're going to then try to put the two together. How do hormones affect cognitive decline? And obviously, cognitive decline and dementia is a multifactorial um, situation. Um, we start with heredity, predisposition, and there are various other components, such as vitamin deficiencies, infections trauma, uh, accumulation of toxins in the brain, circulatory insufficiency uh, via vascular disease or heart disease, underlying chronic diseases which cause inflammation such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. All of these are part of the mix of what we see in people that have cognitive decline. Um, so how do the hormones affect dementia in a rather direct or indirect way? Underlying inflammatory diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity um, uh, cause uh, inflammation throughout the body and can contribute to uh, cognitive impairment. Um, there can be enhanced entry of toxins into the brain um, through uh, disruption of the blood-brain barrier and some impaired clearance of these toxins. There can be accelerated vascular disease with narrowing of arteries, especially critical arteries in the brain to, to the brain and in the brain to critical brain structures. And then there are direct toxic effects of excess hormones. Also, there are hormone deficiencies which impair cognition. So let me go through uh, these in a little more systematic approach. Number one, let's look at excess hormones causing direct shrinking of critical areas of the brain, especially those that are pertinent to memory. Number two, deficiencies. So on the one hand, there is excess, on the other hand, there are deficiencies of hormones, which over time lead to cognitive decline. Number three, hormone 
hormones role in the disruption of that protective blood brain barrier that keeps out toxins and keeps out uh, critical uh, uh, accumulation of structures that can destroy brain tissue. Um, and number four, hormones in <clears throat> excess and deceit states that impair the cerebral circulation with diminished blood flow to critical areas of the brain. And I will explain that in a little more detail, but it has to do with the acceleration of vascular disease, the acceleration of arteriosclerosis in the brain. And number five, interference with the clearance of toxic substances, beta amyloid and the neuro neurofibrinal tangles, which will cause buildup and destruction of cognitive function. So let's take number one, direct shrinkage of the brain. Well, cortisol and adrenaline um, have a sort of paradoxical effect. In an acute stress reaction of fight and flight, cortisol and adrenaline elevations are correlated with impaired, improved, excuse me, improved cognition. So you're you're very aware of things. You're very sensitive. Um, you are in the moment. Um, and I want to step back one one step and say that in uh, an acute stress reaction, as social beings, we actually have a first step that we we don't usually speak about. We always go to the fight or flight. But the first step is actually the social connection, the ability to work together and ask for help. But when that's not available, when we feel isolated, we then trigger the fight or flight cortisol and adrenaline reaction. So the activity and activation of these stress hormones is life-saving and self-limited in its effect on the brain. Either you fight or you hightail it uh, away from the danger. And uh, in those states, you are in a heightened awareness and your mental capacities are improved. But as I said, it's paradoxical because um, with prolonged elevations of cortisol and adrenaline, um, there is an opposite effect on cognition. Prolonged excess cortisol actually shrinks the hippocampal area of the brain, which is the the prime memory area of the brain. And if we look at Alzheimer's disease, it has been correlated with chronic elevations of cortisol levels. Number two, sex hormone deficiencies and their effects on cognition. The uh, testosterone and estrogen levels correlate with uh, improved cognition. So the higher the testosterone and estrogen levels in male and females, the better cognition uh, people have in terms of their ability to perform on tests. It's been shown actually that supplementation around menopause for women with exogenous estrogen is actually protective of cognition later in life. However, when exogenous estrogen is taken after menopause, the reverse is true. So there's kind of a, uh, again, a paradox there. We also know that um, with aging, there is a decline in testosterone and estrogen levels, and this correlates with cognitive decline. And one way that we actually um, have shown this to be true is in the treatment of prostate cancer when you utilize something called androgen deprivation therapy, where in order to starve the tumor, uh, you uh, create a chemical castration and knock out all the testosterone. And this has a deleterious effect on cognition which is temporary and returns to baseline when the therapy ends and the testosterone levels return to normal. Postmenopausal women and androgen-deprived men also 
tend to have accelerated vascular disease, which impacts the cerebral circulation and indirectly cognition. Number three, hormonal effect on the blood-brain barrier and its integrity. We know that such disease states as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity lead to a chronic inflammatory state. And this chronic inflammation damages the protective blood-brain barrier, allowing the influx of chemicals, toxins, and in infectious agents to disrupt normal cognitive function. These disease states have been linked to chronic elevations of two hormones, insulin and cortisol. So chronic inflammatory states are really a precondition for vascular damage. Hormones such as insulin mediate the inflammation, which affects the lining of all blood vessels. Leptin, which is a hormone which regulates fat stores, may also play a role in this and actually is the counterpart to insulin. What we do know is that uh, with vascular disease, the less vascular damage that we have in our brains, the more easily we can tolerate lesions of Alzheimer's disease, uh, the buildup of the plaque uh, with, uh, without, should be without <laughs> exhibiting signs of dementia. It is the extent and location of vascular damage in the brain that appears to be the determining factor. This, the implication is that accumulation of damage to neurons and blood vessels is unavoidable in the process of aging. We all go through this, but there is a point when the slow accumulation of the Alzheimer's lesions and vascular damage passes some threshold and manifests itself as dementia. Diabetics are always more likely to reach that threshold sooner than non-diabetics, if only because they have accumulated vascular damage more rapidly. Indirect uh, effect. The indirect vascular effect. High insulin levels are associated with the progression of vascular lesions throughout the body and in the brain due to their role in inflammation and the deposits of cholesterol in the arteries. So the subsequent narrowed arteries lead to decreased blood flow and decreased oxygen delivery to critical brain tissue. Diminished circulation to the brain makes it more susceptible to the additive effects of other dementias. Thus, those who have predisposing vascular disease accelerate their cognitive decline. Impaired clearance of amyloid. This is a second insulin mechanism which can contribute to dementia. So on the one hand, insulin through its inflammatory um, process can narrow the arteries it can also impair the clearing of amyloid. There is a substance called insulin degrading enzyme, and it has two primary tasks. The first is to degrade insulin into a non-active material once it is no longer needed. And the second is to degrade amyloid so that it can be, it can be cleared from the brain. Since these two processes are in competition, having elevated insulin levels inhibits the clearing of amyloid and creates greater buildup. Fat cells, fat cells hormone leptin and its effect on cognition. So leptin is a hormone that is released by white adipose tissue and also the small intestines in response to feeding. Leptin helps regulate energy production and homeostasis. Decreased leptin levels will lead to hyperphagia, overeating, weight gain, and insulin resistance. Conversely, prolonged high levels of leptin uh, 
levels due to diet, stress, or lack of sleep may cause the impairment of the transport of leptin across the blood-brain barrier and create leptin deficiency in the brain, leading to a cycle of obesity. So leptin is correlated with increased memory, increased brain volume, gray matter, and increased hippocampal size, which also is the area where we have memory. However, um, and there are leptin receptors in the hypothalamus, the cerebral cortex, and the hippocampus, three critical areas. Uh, when we have obesity with increased leptin levels, something happens that's kind of counterintuitive. There becomes uh, leptin resistance and leptin uh, insulin resistance in the brain. And that is due to an alteration in the blood-brain barrier transport of these substances. There is diminished number of leptin and insulin receptors in the brain. And because of this lack of insulin and lack of leptin receptors in the brain, cognitive decline ensues. Possible predictors of Alzheimer's disease. So early on in Alzheimer's disease, there is a noted weight loss of most patients. This is correlated with high leptin levels and appetite suppression. This may even precede obvious signs of dementia. Later on, there is diminished leptin levels in the brain. There are diminished level leptin levels in the brain and concomitant overeating, obesity, and worsening cognition. It is felt that prolonged elevated leptin levels may cause leptin resistance and diminished leptin crossing the blood-brain barrier and subsequent effects of actually low levels of leptin in the brain itself. Now let's shift to something called melatonin, which is... Um, the uh, hormone that we are we need for sleep. Um, melatonin is activated by uh, by dark. And actually, melatonin is a um, is a product of serotonin in that serotonin produces melatonin. So those two are actually um, paired together. Um, melatonin has an effect on something called the glymphatic system in the brain, which is equivalent to the lymphatic system in the rest of the body. And the lymphatic system is the, is the clearing system to clear all of our debris and uh, get all our toxins and dead, dead tissues out of the, the body. And in the brain, the glymphatic system does the same thing. And it is activated during sleep and particularly during non-REM sleep. During non-REM sleep, this lymphatic system expands by 60% and is much, able, much better able to filter toxic metabolites and amyloid. But disturbances in sleep due to melatonin dysfunction uh, adds to cognitive decline because there is not a good a lymphatic expansion during those periods. Oops, sorry. Did I go? <laughs> so, as I said before, um, serotonin is a precursor to melatonin, and this is a balanced relationship. Serotonin modulates melatonin secretion and indirectly affects this toxin clearance. Serotonin is affected by light, by daylight, and again, melatonin by the dark. 95% of serotonin is made in the gut, and the microbiome affects this production. Thus, microbiome will affect mood, memory, and motility via serotonin. So the 
the effects on the brain, serotonin levels, if they're adequate, they'll produce adequate melatonin levels. They will improve non-REM sleep, which is the part of sleep that clears uh, amyloid toxins and, and thus diminishes the uh, buildup of uh, amyloid products. It improves memory. So selective serotonin re-up, reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, improve cognition. And we've seen that. So um, as we age, however, there is a decrease in uh, the density of serotonin receptors in the brain. And serotonin levels alter the process of amyloid genesis and buildup. Low melatonin levels are linked to cognitive decline. As I said before, melatonin is, is essential in healthy REM and non-REM sleep. And non-REM sleep is the time where the cerebral spinal fluid is able to clear out excess uh, amyloid toxins through the lymphatic, or as we call it, glymphatic system. Less non-REM sleep contributes to more amyloid buildup due to less clearance. Melatonin levels are actually directly related to good sleep hygiene. And in some cases, uh, the need for um, CPAP is something that would optimize this hormone. In addition, um, by sleep hygiene, it's also meant that you should be in a dark place because darkness actually activates the melatonin. Um, cortisol and adrenaline, these stress hormones, are a function of chronic stress, which has many causes and can be modified through many different avenues. Testosterone and estrogen levels are a function of age, stress, lifestyle, and diet. And insulin levels can be modified through diet and lifestyle. Leptin levels can be modified through diet, stress, re stress reduction, and sleep. So modifying insulin and leptin, uh, the key would be regular exercise, which has been shown to improve basal insulin levels. Insulin elevation and insulin resistance, which is the hallmark of the metabolic system, is also tied to leptin levels. And both of these, leptin and insulin, can be modified through lifestyle and diet. Lower intake of processed foods, refined carbohydrates, and sugar will decrease both insulin and leptin. Increased fiber intake will also decrease insulin levels. I, I, I apologize, I didn't mean uh, decreased leptin. I meant decreased insulin and will maintain leptin levels at its proper level. I know there's a lot of material, but uh, most of it has to do with uh, understanding that the complexity of our body um, is really uh, um, very sensitive to our environment, both external and internal. And by that, I mean the stressors that we have and um, what we eat, um, our social interactions, and our ability to um, create a situation where we are as healthy as we can be and our internal environment will reflect that. Thank you. And um, I will take questions as, as they come. Thank you very much. Actually, I had a question come in already. Okay. <laughs> If a medication is given to block testosterone, is there an effect on cognition? Yes, there is. Um, so uh, you know, there's, there have been many studies that have shown that um, uh, there is a, a there, there are different types of uh, testosterone blockers. Some of them actually decrease testosterone. Some of them actually decrease the receptors. Those that decrease testosterone, um, from my knowledge, are the ones that 
uh, affect cognition. And uh, they're usually used in, um, in uh, uh, prostate cancer treatments, but I'm sure they're used in other, you know, gender, gender treatments, things like that. So it is important to understand that that's, that is a side effect. Thank you. What is the better option, natural melatonin supplements or prescription sleeping pills? Um, well, I mean... Uh, I'm sure there are pros and cons. <laughs> there are pros and cons. Uh, obviously, sleeping pills, um, the big problem with sleeping pills is that uh, you become accustomed to them and dependent upon them. Um Melatonin, if it works, is probably safer. The problem with melatonin doesn't always work. And um, there are other factors that have to do with uh, sleep hygiene that are probably as important to address than melatonin levels. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I would suggest trying melatonin first, addressing the um, uh, the sleep hygiene. Um, and if if uh, there is any question, uh, sleep study may be uh, appropriate. And as a, lad as a last resort, um, using chemicals to, to mm -hmm. suppress sleep. So, Thank you. A similar question did come in. So the over-the-counter melatonin supplements, um, that, that is really the only option, correct? I think that's, yeah, it is not a prescription okay. as far as I know. Okay, thank you. And, um, there, There is, um, I think, certain ways that you're supposed to take it. And I've heard that you're supposed to take it several hours before sleep. Mm -hmm. um, you're supposed to take three to five milligrams. Um, shouldn't take too much. You should start slow. And, um, and if it doesn't work, it probably won't work, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. There's one. I've noticed with the family member that they lost a lot of weight when they had the advanced dementia. So it has to deal with the leptin levels. Would you say? So um, I think with advanced de dementia, so the theory or, or what, what we've seen is that early on, um, there are um, elevated leptin levels and they lose weight early on. <clears throat> then as the leptin level um, creates what we call... Um, uh, resistance, in other words, uh, the blood-brain barrier supposedly is not letting in the leptin, or it's uh, it may have been overwhelmed, but the leptin receptors actually diminish in the brain, mm. and so you have the effect of low levels of leptin, and that causes obesity. But in the end, as people advance through dementia, their ability to actually eat or or even have um, desire for food fades away so that in the late stages think what you're seeing is 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 probably nothing to do with leptin yeah. unfortunately mm. thank you You talked about in your presentation about, um, as we as we hear, the research is about um, the plaques and tangles found on the brain um, with Alzheimer's disease. So can you talk a little bit more? I know you mentioned the hormones um, can affect the buildup of plaques and tangles. Are they researching that right now with this hormone? Is there a, studies going on right now with that? So... The the only hormone that sort of directly 
will affect that is insulin because insulin um, through insulin degrading enzyme, insulin com competes with amyloid. Uh, the and so uh, it, there's just so much insulin degrading enzyme around. And if you have high levels of insulin, you are going to compete with that uh, degrader and you will have less degradation and clearance of amyloid. So that'll build up. Um, the only other way that it, uh, these hormones affect it, they've shown this in numerous studies that um, uh, high insulin levels lead to vascular to vascular disease. Vascular disease is directly correlated with worsening dementia so that you can have vascular dementia, but you many times have a mixed picture of vascular and Alzheimer's so that it's additive, so that you narrow the arteries through um, vascular problems, whatever Alzheimer's is there from plaque and uh, neurofibrinal uh, tangles, it accentuates it and uh, makes it uh, worse. So it's it's an additive effect. And that's basically that hormone, um, insulin is the one that uh, does that. I, I also mentioned that cortisol, you know, there are some studies that high levels of cortisol will directly over chronic periods of long periods of time will chronically shrink the hippocampal area of the brain. We do know that also. So those two hormones are probably the ones that are studied the most. Mm -hmm. And um we're not sure why, but that's been well documented through MRIs and uh, through serial cortisol levels and things like that over time. And this is talking about years and years of elevation, chronic elevation of, uh, of these stress hormones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have advice on um, when you can start thinking about hormones? I mean, are you talking with your doctor early on? What is your advice to kind of be on the lookout for, for how hormones can affect brain health? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, naturally we we have um, a steady lowering uh, of our hormone levels as we age. Um, in women, it's postmenopausally, it's, it's, it's dramatic. Um, there are studies that have shown that when you take that five-year interval, um, the perimenopausal interval, and you supplement um, with estrogen, and again, probably the reason why we supplement as estrogen is to block the the effects of menopause, the, the deleterious effects in some people. But there has been um, significant improvement or ma maintenance of, of mental capacity during those periods and compared to people that don't take that. So if you were to supplement with uh, estrogen, we'd only take it during that period. And, and probably um, there's always a downside um, of, uh, of, of taking anything. And with estrogen, um, you know, there, there are some studies that um, there may be increased risk of uh, thrombophobitis or, you know, other, other issues that, um, that have to be taken into consideration. Um, in terms of testosterone, I'm I don't know that there's really a good reason to be supplementing with testosterone period for for any reason except maybe someone who has had a what they call a uh, hypothesectomy where the hypothalamus, the pituitary area has been removed and those hormones, 
have been totally ablated through surgery because there was a tumor there. Mm -hmm. Those people, they need their testosterone. They need their cortisol. But those are regular, regulated very, uh, you know, uh, very finely by the endocrinologist. And uh, they get thyroid, they get cortisol, and they get testosterone. Um, so that that is well documented or um they you know they get the sex hormones male or female they they have levels they're maintained at a very narrow range um to mimic what is natural but those are really the only reasons i i think that anybody should be thinking about that so again everything's a double-edged sword <laughs> and hormones there's a good part and there's and there's and there's a bad part mm -hmm. You have to have it kind of right in the middle. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. All right. Thank you for presenting tonight, Dr. Grossman. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so just to, to kind of go over again some of our services at JFSA, um, Nicole and I um, are care navigators for Alzheimer's disease and dementia support program. We meet with people in the community as necessary to, um, you know, really help families um, figure out different solutions to keeping their loved one at home as long as possible. And if the time comes that um, a transition is needed to um, a higher level of care, we have assisted in that process as well. Um, we work with uh, two geriatricians on our team, Dr. Elizabeth O'Toole and Dr. Constance Magulius. They come to us at our clinic at JFSA, Allison's Place, and um, they work very closely with Nicole and I on um, various solutions for, for the families we work with. Also on our team is Frank Petrelli. He assists in completing our cognitive assessments with clients. And we also work with Leanne Stuver, who um, is also one of our guest panelists for our Brain Health and Wellness Initiative. And then um, Pamela Lynch is new to our team. She is going to be working with us as we are um, rolling out a new workshop. Um, hopefully in January, our, uh, it will be about caregiver education. Um, as we mentioned, we'll have our Caregiving with Confidence workshops coming up. We do have um, an online support group through Zoom that meets twice a month, uh, the second and the fourth Mondays of the month. So if you or um, a family member would be interested in participating in that, please give us a call and we can get you connected. And then our um, next presentation will be next month on December 15th, and Leanne Stuver will be back with us presenting on the importance of eating a brain-healthy diet. And please note, we are meeting again on the third week of the month. I know that's not our typical, but with the holidays, we moved it up again by a week. So if you're interested in that, we will be sending out the information for that soon, or you can give us a call to register. All right. Thank you all very much, and I hope you have a good evening.